The ecosystems of our oceans are fragile and depend on healthy plants, kelps and algae, to feed the smallest creatures in the ocean and the bottom of the food chain, plankton and krill. Plants and algae serve many roles, from supplying necessary nutrients to acting as an incubator for octopus, squid, cuttlefish and nudibranchs. Even sea turtles eat algae. Plankton and krill supply the basic building blocks for everything else in the ocean's ecosystems to survive. Next up the food chain are coral and other plant-like creatures. Then we have small water filtering creatures such as mussels, clams and abalone, along with other crab-like creatures, lobsters, opelio crab, king crab and dungeness crab. Then come gobies, anchovies, sardines, smelt and other bait fish. Next are small predators blacktail snapper, archerfish, white-spotted puffers, and gray and blue sharks. Then there are the predators of the reef, such as the moray eel, crannock snapper, yellow snapper, blue surgeon fish, and spotted rockfish, just to name a few. Next is the grouper, whether black or silver gray. These predators rank up there with the moray eels and sharks as far as hunting goes. The farthest up the food chain is the whale shark, gray whale, and the mighty blue whale, all of which survive by filtration eating. After swimming through a bait ball or school of their preferred food, they strain seawater and prey through their mouth, the largest of them eating one quarter to one half a ton per mouthful of plankton and krill at a time. So as we can see, every creature on the reef plays an essential part in the bigger picture, supporting life in the oceans. When one link in this food chain breaks, all the links above it cannot sustain themselves. Comprising over 70% of the Earth's surface, water is undoubtedly one of the most precious natural resources that exists on our planet. Without this invaluable compound, comprised of hydrogen and oxygen, life on Earth would be non-existent. It is essential for everything on our planet to grow and prosper. Man has been studying the oceans for centuries, but only recently have we begun to understand a very important connection, how oceans and human health are inextricably linked. We hear about global warming and know it is a concern, but we're just learning what impacts warmer seas may have, increased incidence of harmful algae blooms, and easier spread of waterborne infectious diseases. When we pollute the environment, and specifically our oceans, we find that it has deleterious effects not only on marine life, but on our own lives as well. The thermohaline circulation is the global density-driven circulation of the oceans. Wind-driven surface currents, such as the Gulf Stream, head polewards from the equatorial Atlantic Ocean, cooling all the while and eventually sinking at high latitudes, forming North Atlantic deep water. This dense water then flows into the ocean basins. While the bulk of it upwells in the Southern Ocean, the oldest waters upwell in the North Pacific. Extensive mixing therefore takes place between the ocean basins, reducing differences between them and making the Earth's ocean a global system. On their journey, the water masses transport both energy in the form of heat and matter solids, dissolved substances, and gases around the globe. As such, the state of the circulation has a large impact on the climate of the Earth and the marine life in the oceans. When it comes to mixing oil and water, oceans suffer from far more than an occasional devastating spill. Disasters make headlines, but hundreds of millions of gallons of oil quietly end up in the seas every year, mostly from non-accidental sources. Used engine oil can end up in waterways. An average oil change uses five quarts. One change can contaminate a million gallons of fresh water. Oil in runoff from land, municipal, and industrial wastes ends up in the oceans. Only about 10% of oil pollution in oceans is due to major tanker accidents. New tanker construction guidelines have helped, but one big spill can disrupt sea and shore life for up to a thousand miles. Every year, oily road runoff from a city of five million could contain as much oil as one large tanker spill. Scientists know that oil and metal contaminants polluting the seas can seep into marsh and subtidal sediments 
have lurked there for decades, negatively affecting marsh grasses, marine worms, and other aquatic life forms that live in, on, or near the sediment. Dredging stimulates the release of the toxins into surrounding waters, where they may enter the food chain. Not only do oil spills look bad and destroy our beaches and sea life, but also for local fishermen, it is devastating because it wipes out their livelihood. It becomes impossible for them to reach clean waters for fishing to provide for their families and sell at markets. Oil-covered fur or feathers can't insulate marine mammals and diving birds from cold water. And when an animal cleans itself, it also swallows oil. Oil gets into their eyes so that they can't see. They are unable to feed themselves, cannot swim or fly. The same amount of oil can do more damage in some areas than others. Coral reefs and mangroves are more sensitive to oil than sandy beaches or seagrass beds. Intertidal zones are the most sensitive. Crude oil, more damaging than fuel oil, is extremely hard on the ecosystem and causes the worst problems. Thermal pollution is another source of industrial pollution. Cooling water from power plants and industrial sites kills off corals and other temperature-sensitive sedentary species, often displacing other marine life. Mercury finds its way into water primarily through air pollution and other industrial processes. In the water, elementary mercury is converted to methylmercury, after which it moves up the food chain of fish and may end up on your dinner plate. Electroplating processes leach out heavy metals, chromium and cyanide sulfide, silver and nickel nitrates, into the environment through the ground. About 65,000 chemicals are used commercially in the U.S. today, with about 1,000 new ones added each year. Only about 300 have been extensively tested for toxicity. Air pollution, mainly from cars and industry, places hundreds of tons of hydrocarbons into the air each year, where they settle on the ocean floors and accumulate. Particles settle, and rain washes hydrocarbons from the air into the oceans. Raw sewage, garbage, and oil spills have begun to overwhelm the diluting capabilities of the oceans, and most coastal waters are now polluted. Beaches around the world are closed regularly because of high amounts of bacteria from sewage disposal, and marine wildlife is beginning to suffer. Pollution affects the algae blooms in coastal waters. Decomposing algae depletes water of oxygen, killing other marine life. It can spur algae blooms, red tides, releasing toxins that can kill fish and poison people. Domoic acid poisoning occurs in red tide conditions, when predator marine animals such as sea lions, dolphins, and seabirds ingest high concentrations of this neurotoxin, it can cause disorientation, tremors, seizures, and even death. Agriculture, including commercial livestock and poultry farming, is the source of many organic and inorganic pollutants in surface waters and groundwater. These contaminants include both sediment from erosion and compounds of phosphorus and nitrogen phosphates that partly originate in animal wastes and commercial fertilizers, often harboring pathogenic organisms. In terms of general human health effects, pesticides can affect and damage the nervous system, cause liver damage, damage DNA, cause a variety of cancers, cause reproductive and endocrine damage, and have other acutely toxic or chronic effects. Pesticides are carried in rainwater runoff from farm fields, suburban lawns, or roadside embankments into the nearest creeks and streams, migrating via water into the food chain, ultimately being consumed by humans or animals in food. Pathogens from sewage and livestock runoff not only contaminate coastal swimming areas and seafood, but spread cholera, typhoid, and other diseases. When plastic film and other debris settle on the bottom, they can suffocate immobile plants and animals, producing areas essentially devoid of life. In areas with some currents, such as coral reefs, debris can wrap around living coral, smothering the animals and breaking up their coralline structures. Trolling, a very indiscriminate method of fishing, often traps mammals underwater for long periods of time. 
They die from lack of oxygen and are thrown back into the sea by the fishermen to avoid fines by law enforcement agencies. Irresponsible fishing practices, such as discarding used or broken nets overboard, often trap and kill helpless sea life. Trash can kill. When odds and ends of life on land, particularly plastics, end up in the sea, they can harm marine life when they are mistaken for food or entangle animals. The victims are helpless to expel or dislodge the deadly plastics and die. The typical floatable debris from combined sewer overflows includes street litter, sewage, including condoms, tampons, and applicators, and medical items, such as syringes, resin pellets, and other material that might have washed into the storm drains or from land runoff. These materials or objects can make it unsafe to walk on the beaches, and pathogens or algae's blooms can make it unsafe to swim. Swimming in or ingesting such waters can result in human health problems such as sore throat, gastroenteritis, meningitis, or even encephalitis. It can also contaminate shellfish beds and make it unsafe to eat the fish caught from the waters. Waves pound the debris onto the breakwater walls, reducing the plastic and styrofoam into microparticles, which are then ingested by innocent sea life that mistake it for food. Unable to digest or expel these foreign materials, they often starve to death. The plastic containers we use every day, that is, water, soda, milk bottles, plastic bags, food containers, oil containers, etc., had their beginnings as nurdles, these tiny round plastic pellets. One can see here a perfect example of poor handling of industrial materials as we follow spillage from the accident inception to the sea and what promises to be the demise of some sea life. With a throughput of up to 450 million gallons per day, Hyperion Treatment Facility in Los Angeles treats wastewater from houses and businesses, plus the outflow from the storm drainage system. On reaching the facility, wastewater has large objects, such as plastic, rags, metals, and plants, filtered out by the headworks and trucked away to a sanitary landfill. Then it is sent to underground tanks the size of football fields called sedimentary tanks to settle out dust and sand. Here chemicals are added to coagulate solids to the bottom before the water is pumped to the reactors where oil and grease are skimmed off and the water is oxygenated. After oxygenation, everything is pumped to the digesters where microorganisms eat the organics. The byproduct of this is methane gas, which is sent next door to the power plant to generate electricity for Hyperion's daily operations. Leaving the digesters, the water then goes to the clarifiers, where the water settles out eventually becoming clean enough to be discharged into Santa Monica Bay through a five-mile pipeline. However, about 30 million gallons per day of this treated water is diverted to West Basin Municipal Water District for filtration and reuse. West Basin is a two-fold facility, recycling for industrial and seawater barrier use from Hyperion and supplying drinking water to Los Angeles. This facility produces 30 million gallons of recycled water every day. The process employed there replicates nature's water process but does it faster. The microfiltration process filters the water, passing it through membranes that are 5,000 times smaller than a pinhole. The resulting water is clean, having removed dirt, bacteria, and most viruses. The clean water then passes through microscopic membranes 5 million times smaller than a pinhole, at a pressure of 200 pounds per square inch. This process, called reverse osmosis, removes salts, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, viruses, and bacteria. Many bottle water companies use reverse osmosis to purify the water they sell. If there are any particles remaining after microfiltration and reverse osmosis, they get zapped in the ultraviolet radiation process. In nature, sunlight removes pathogens with its UV rays. The recycled water UV process removes pathogens, making the water ultra-pure, as pure as distilled water. The resulting water is transported through purple pipes to more than 200 recycled water customers throughout the South Bay for use in irrigation, cooling towers, and even street sweepers. 
Some of the ultra-pure water produced here is used to protect our groundwater by being injected into the seawater barrier. The seawater barrier protects the Los Angeles aquifer, natural groundwater, from seawater intrusion. What's left over is sludge that is trucked to a local landfill to help break down what's there. This process keeps 50 tons of treated sewage from being dumped into Santa Monica Bay every day, helping to protect our local marine habitats. West Basin furthered its commitment to energy conservation and environmentally sound practices by completing the installation of a 60,000 square foot solar power generating system. The solar panels generate 10% of the facility's peak power demands. They produce an estimated 783,000 kilowatt hours per year of solar energy, enough to power nearly 100 homes for one year and dramatically reducing the carbon emissions that would otherwise pollute. The amount of water produced every day at this facility is enough to replace the amount of drinking water needed by 60,000 families every year. From 1990 to 2005, West Basin's service area grew by 100,000 people, while the water usage remained the same due to West Basin's proactive water recycling and conservation programs. Recycled water produced at this facility uses one-sixth the energy needed to import water from the state water project. The water pollution problem is global. Newly industrialized countries facing rapid growth of urban population, along with the industrial growth, has outpaced the ability of governments to expand sewage and water infrastructure. Estimates suggest that nearly 1.5 billion people lack safe drinking water and that at least 5 million deaths per year can be attributed to waterborne diseases. Developed countries are not immune to the problem of infectious waterborne diseases. Every year, 7 million Americans are sickened by contaminated water. Governmental agencies around the world have passed laws to combat water pollution, but governments alone cannot fix the problem. It is up to each individual to be informed, responsible, and involved. We must understand our local water resources and how to dispose of harmful wastes. We must act responsibly where fertilizers might run off into surface water, preserve existing trees and planting foliage to help prevent soil erosion, and promote water infiltration into the soil. Gutters and storm drains must be kept free of automotive oil, litter, and yard debris. The developed world must participate with the developing world to ensure that new industrialized economies do not add to the world's environmental problems. Politicians need to focus on sustainable development rather than economic expansion. Global environmental collapse is not inevitable. However, conservation strategies have to become more widely accepted, and people must understand that energy use can be dramatically diminished without sacrificing comfort. Awareness and education will continue to be the two most important ways to prevent water pollution. And, given the technology that currently exists, the years of global environmental mistreatment can be reversed. Over time, and with vigilance and respect for the planet, we can clean up the pollution in our waters.